Welcome to Whiskey Cask, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 838 for September 27th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes... When they dug up this concrete floor in this nondescript room, they started running into these old foundations. And they were like, that guy that's around here that does whiskey um, distillery archaeology, let's call him and see what he thinks. There have been hundreds of small distilleries all over Kentucky, going back to the days when Kentucky was still part of Virginia back in colonial times. Most of the histories of those distilleries have been lost to time, But there are still physical traces of them, if you know where to look. Nicholas Laraquente built his reputation as the bourbon archaeologist by finding those traces and putting them into historical context. His most famous project was deciphering the ruins of the Bourbon Pompeii at Buffalo Trace Distillery, where workers uncovered the long-buried remains of one of Colonel E. H. Taylor's earliest distilleries while trying to restore an old building. My conversation with Nicholas Laraquente is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and... (laughs) You're not going to get a scoop from me, Mark. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Whatever could Rachel Berry be talking about? It's all ahead on this week's Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the week's news. The Scotch Whiskey Association is launching a new industry wide diversity and inclusion effort this week. The SWA's Diversity and Inclusion Charter sets out benchmarks for all member companies to meet when it comes to not only gender and racial diversity, but LGBTQIA, the disabled, and other underrepresented groups. Each of the SWA's 75 member companies will have to have at least one executive responsible and accountable for the company's diversity and inclusion efforts. SWA Chief Executive Karen Betts called the charter just the start of the conversation. The timing of the announcement is coincidental since the program has been in the works for some time now, but it comes just as the whiskey industry is facing its latest controversy over sexism. Of course, that's the debate over Jim Murray's use of what some consider to be sexist language not only in his 2021 edition of the Whiskey Bible, but throughout his career as a whiskey writer. Once again, we need to credit Becky Paskin for raising the issue last Sunday in social media. And since last week's episode, we have learned that Philippe Schreiberg of Forbes also played a major role in bringing this issue to the limelight. But the real news is the response from within the whiskey industry itself to Murray's words, In addition to the Scotch Whiskey Association, many of the major whiskey companies issued statements this week denouncing not only Murray's use of objectifying language specifically, but in a much wider context. Among those going on the record, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, William Grant & Sons, Brown Foreman, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and even Beam Suntory, which said it is reviewing future plans to promote the award that Murray gave its Alberta Premium Cask Strength Canadian Whiskey as, quote, the world's best whiskey in this edition. In addition to that, the Whiskey Exchange in London and the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin both said they will no longer sell the Whiskey Bible in their stores and on their websites. The topic has been widely discussed on social media and even during a few online tastings this week. I asked Brown Foreman's Rachel Berry about it during a Ben Riach tasting with whiskey writers on Wednesday. And please note, this is completely unedited. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the biggest fan of diversity. So for me, everything is about inclusion. 
Um, and um, yeah, excluding anyone is, you know, is a mistake um, in the world of whiskey. So, yeah, I mean, I've 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 met met Jim before, so <laughs> I'm probably best to say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get a scoop from me, Mark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jim Murray responded as well. He issued a statement Monday calling the charges that he is sexist, quote, trumped up, and to quote here, an attack on the very essence of what it is to be a critic in any sphere, be it music, art, sport, wine, or whiskey. In other words, an attack on free thought and free speech. One company we have not heard from yet, Sazerac, which has received numerous awards in previous editions of the Whiskey Bible. Its Stag Junior Bourbon was the runner-up in this year's World's Best Whiskey Rankings from Murray. Sazerac has not responded to our request for a comment on the story, but we might see something along those lines this coming week. That's because Michael John the head distiller and blender at John Distilleries in India that has Sazerac ownership ties, did respond by email when I asked him about his LinkedIn post this week, touting the number three ranking for Paul John Mithuna and high ratings for other Paul John expressions. He deferred comment to the PR team, but said in his email, quote, I guess Sazerac and John Distilleries are preparing for a joint statement sometime next week. In addition, I quoted in the last episode the Penderin tasting note that Becky Paskin cited in her commentary. Penderin Chief Executive Stephen Davies put his own post on LinkedIn a week ago, mentioning the 18 Liquid Gold Awards his team's whiskeys received in this year's Whiskey Bible. I reached out to him by email as well. He declined to comment on the issue. We'll have more on this story later in Your Voice. In other news, while New Jersey reported its highest daily increase in coronavirus cases since June this weekend, one of the few live whiskey events to take place since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, appears to have so far been a success in terms of not spreading the virus. The Whiskey and Barrel Night event in Paramus, New Jersey, September 16th, was held in compliance with state regulations at a catering venue with a large outdoor patio that allowed stands to be spread out for proper social distancing. Since that night, local health departments in Bergen and the five surrounding counties have only reported 12 new cases of COVID-19, and none have been linked to the Whiskey and Barrel Night event. We should note, though, that since Paramus is a suburb of New York City, those figures do not include anyone who may have traveled from New York to the event. Longtime Malt Maniacs member Peter Silver is a veteran of whiskey festivals around the world, and he was on hand that night. I was concerned because I'm in a high-risk group that uh, people wouldn't stay six feet apart and not everyone would have a mask on. But the organizers did such a good job in spacing out the tables and the people who attended were so nice and polite. Everyone kept the distance. People were wearing masks when they weren't drinking whiskey or eating food. Uh, So I felt pretty safe there. Whiskey and Barrel Night organizers plan similar guidelines for their Whiskey Obsession Festival, scheduled for November 4th in Tampa, Florida. This week, Florida's governor removed all capacity limits at the state's bars and restaurants, while limiting the ability of local governments to impose their own restrictions. We are getting more details now on what is planned for the virtual version of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival, coming up next month. Bourbon writer Steve Coombs recorded more than 20 video interviews with bourbon makers to be streamed during the weekend of October 15th through the 18th. He joined us on Friday night's Happy Hour webcast. I think it'll be good. I think, uh, and it will certainly foreshadow what's going to happen in 2021 and that we're placing a much greater emphasis on, number one, focusing on the whiskey, number two, focusing on the people who make the whiskey and sell it and the history behind it. I think the Bourbon Festival in the past has uh, become a little bit too much of a, 
an event for Bardstown. Great community, got a lot of friends down there, and it was a natural progression for that to become more of a community event that attracted a lot of outsiders. But um, the potential for that event, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival, to become you know a, a whiskey event on a national scale and of national regard, I think is there. I think you'll see a taste of that this year. Festival organizers have said next year's event will be completely different from previous bourbon festivals. And Steve gave us a hint. He predicted a lot of special barrel picks will be part of next year's bourbon festival. Meanwhile, this Saturday's Isla Jazz Festival in Scotland is another one of the events forced to go virtual in the wake of the pandemic. Lagavulin is the sponsor of the festival organized by Jazz Scotland and will be streaming this year's performances Saturday on the Lagavulin and Friends of the Classic Malts Facebook pages. There will still be a special Lagavulin Isla Jazz Festival release, though. It's a 22-year-old single malt matured in refill American and European oak casks. It'll be available at the distillery's shop for 405 pounds a bottle. There is no word yet on online availability. Elsewhere on Isla, Brooke Laddie has unveiled this year's Octomore 11 series of heavily peated single malts. There are four different releases, with the usual point series, explaining the differences in three of them. 11.1 is five years old. It's matured in 100% first fill American whiskey casks and bottled at 59.4% ABV. 11.2 is, as in past years, matured for five years in a combination of American and European oak wine casks. It's bottled at 58.6% ABV. 11.3 is the Isla Grown Barley Edition again this year. It's also matured in First Fill American Whiskey Casks for five years and bottled at 61.7% ABV. And finally, there's a new Octomore 10-year-old edition, It uses first and second fill American whiskey casks along with some virgin oak. They'll all go on sale starting this Thursday, October 1st. I'll have tasting notes for a couple of them later on. And while we're in the neighborhood, Jura is auctioning off 470 bottles of a new 19-year-old release to benefit the Scottish Association for Mental Health. The auction went live this Friday on whiskeyauctioneer.com. It'll run through October 5th. It's part of a global campaign by White and Mackay employees to raise money for mental health charities. We have a link for more details in our show notes for this episode at the WhiskeyCast website. Elsewhere in Scotland, we got a hint of Glenn Morangy's latest release a couple of weeks ago on the Happy Hour webcast when a listener asked Glenn Morangy's David Blackmore for details on the latest private edition release, something called Cake. If there was something called Cake, it wouldn't be the 11th member of the private edition. The private edition stopped after 10, and uh, this is just this is something a bit different. And you'll see that when if you've seen the, the, the label leak, it's different. That's for sure. It's um, it's a bit of shock and awe. Uh, we're kind of going at things. Um, as Bill has done a lot, you know, and we kind of picked up on it a bit later, I guess, as the kind of team that that gets out there and either presents the whiskies as an ambassador or markets them. Um, Bill goes a, about the way of making his whiskies, thinking of flavor memories first. And I think that's cool. It's that actually how bartenders often create their, their cocktails. So Bill is actually, I've often said, Bill, you're, you're a mixologist. You don't really realize it, but you are, you know. <laughs> And he starts with an idea of a flavor memory and then tries to reverse engineer the whiskey. And that's the kind of, uh, if there was a whiskey called cake, uh, that would be the the, the theory behind it. Well, David happened to have some of that whiskey in his glass that night. And as we learned this week, it is not named cake, but a tale of cake. And it's finished in Tokai wine casks. It is also not part of the private edition series. Glenn Morangy's Bill Lumsden worked with New York-based pastry chef and cronut creator Dominique Ansel to create a cake tail, pairing the whiskey with a pineapple cake, along with cake tail pairings for the Glenn Morangy core range of single malts. 
A tail of cake will be available in limited quantities with a recommended retail price of $99 a bottle in the U.S. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. The whiskey, that is, not the cake. The McAllen is wrapping up its edition series with edition number six. It's dedicated to the River Spay and the distillery's own gilly, veteran fishing guide Robert Mitchell. Along with a new partnership between the McAllen and the Atlantic Salmon Trust, which helps protect wild salmon and sea trout habitat. Edition number six will be available globally for about $150 a bottle. In the U.S., Brown Foreman is celebrating its 150th anniversary with a special release of the company's original bourbon brand, Old Forester. Actually, there are three releases of the Old Forester 150th Anniversary Batch Proof. 150 barrels were selected by master distiller Chris Morris and then split into the three batches by master taster Jackie Zykan. They'll be available for $150 each, and you'll probably have to look really close to see which batch is which. I'll have tasting notes for all three soon at the Whiskey Cast website, and one of them in a few minutes. Sagamore Spirit in Baltimore is releasing another take on its rye whiskey finished in wine barrels. The latest release is a six-year-old rye finished in Sauvignon Blanc barrels. The two casks were originally intended for blending into the 2018 Vintners Finish release, but the blenders decided to hold them back for a couple of more years to develop. They're available exclusively through the distillery shop and the Sagamore Spirit website. The price tag, $69 a bottle. I've mentioned Finland's Kuro Distillery several times over the years, as they have gotten closer to releasing their first full-bore rye whiskey. It is here now. The Kuro malt rye is made from 100% malted Finnish rye and will be available in limited amounts through the end of this year in Europe, with wider availability next year. It'll have a recommended retail price of around £45 a bottle. Pennsylvania's Manitoni Steelworks is out with Scorpionis. Now, there are no scorpions in Pennsylvania, except maybe in a zoo, but the team at Manitoni took its four-grain white whiskey and aged it in Scorpion Mezcal casks. It'll be available at the distillery and through the Manitoni website for shipping only within Pennsylvania for $35 a bottle. If you heard our feature last week with Australian whiskey maverick Peter Bignell of Belgrove Distillery, he emailed this week with details on a new venture. Seems he was also one of the people caught up in the Nant Distillery barrel investment scheme that collapsed a couple of years ago, in which the distillery's founders sold casks to investors while promising to buy them back several years later for a guaranteed rate of return. It appears many of those casks were never filled before things collapsed, and while Nat is now owned by Australian Whiskey Holdings, several hundred barrels remained in the hands of investors. AWH offered to buy those barrels back from the investors last year, but at prices that were lower than the original investment cost. Peter Bignell, his son, and a group of partners have now purchased around 300 of those casks, and formed an independent bottling company to do something with them. It's called the Remnant Whiskey Company. Remember the references to sheep dung in last week's feature? This appears to be a case of making chicken salad out of chicken... Well, you get the point. Finally, we have a bit of news of our own to report this week. The Tales of the Cocktail Foundation announced this year's Spirited Award winners during the virtual version of this year's Tales, and we are proud to have been named as the winner of the award for Best Broadcast, Podcast, or Online Video Series. Thanks to all of you who have sent along your congratulations on social media, and we are very grateful to you and our sponsors for your support of WhiskeyCast as we get ready to celebrate our 15th anniversary in the next few weeks.
You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Don't forget to join us for our next Whiskey Wednesday live webcast this week. We had planned to have Beam's Freddie No and Brendan O'Rourke of Hudson Whiskey on the show with us this past Wednesday, but we decided to cancel the webcast because of the events that day in Louisville. Both Freddie and Brendan have agreed to come back this week, and we'll also have another special guest. I mentioned the Spirited Award a minute ago. The episode we submitted for judging was from this past February, when Dewar's Malts brand ambassador Una Green joined us just as she was preparing to return to work after winning her fight against breast cancer. She'll be joining us Wednesday to give us an update on her recovery and her return to work just as the coronavirus pandemic hit. That's this Wednesday at 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. London time, and 2100 GMT elsewhere in the world on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. Let's go through the latest event changes that we have in... The Kagai Whiskey and Wine Auction set for October 4th in Tokyo has now been cancelled. It's being replaced by an online auction that runs from October 5th through the 12th. The Manchester Whiskey Festival set for October 23rd and 24th in Manchester, England has now been postponed until next year, along with Whiskey Live in Sydney, Australia that had been set for the last weekend of October. We also have a cancellation in for 2021 already. Canada's Wonderful World of Whiskey show at the NAV Centre in Cornwall, Ontario has now been taken off the centre's schedule. The NAV Centre is a conference and training centre that has been closed to the public since March. And a spokesperson told me this week that they may not be able to host public events until 2022. Now let's look at what will be happening as of now. Remember, all live events are subject to change on very short notice depending on public health restrictions. The Whiskey Exchange's virtual version of the Whiskey Show London gets underway this Friday with online events through October 9th. If you heard our interview a couple of weeks ago with Jarrett Dieterle of the R Street Institute on weird liquor laws, it'll be part of the Institute's webinar October 6th. Bonhams has its next whiskey auction on the 7th in Edinburgh, Scotland. The Whiskey Colors Festival, sponsored by the Whiskey Shop Dufton, is online October 8th through the 12th. The virtual version of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival is October 15th through the 18th. The English Whiskey Society's Virtual Festival is on the 16th and 17th. And the Taipei Whiskey Club in Taiwan has its next tasting October 21st. We're keeping the calendar of events at WhiskeyCast.com updated with the latest changes to events as we get word of them. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. We're wrapping up Bourbon Heritage Month this week with a look into history through the eyes of the bourbon archaeologist. Nicholas Laraquente is an archaeologist with the Kentucky State Historic Preservation Office, and his passion is is uncovering the history of the state's distilleries. He is most well known for the work he did several years ago at Buffalo Trace, when one of the many expansion projects at the distillery 
uncovered the remnants of Colonel E.H. Taylor's original distillery buried inside the OFC building. And by buried, I mean literally buried. The space had been filled in with dirt and rubble, then covered over with concrete. Today, what is known as the Bourbon Pompeii has been restored. There is whiskey maturing now that was fermented in one of the copper-lined vats, and Bourbon Hall of Famer Freddie Johnson leads tours through the place. But, as Nicholas Laraquente told me in an interview at last year's American Whiskey Convention in Philadelphia, none of this would have happened but for a series of happy accidents along the way. Whenever uh, Buffalo Trace started that renovation project of the building, have you been there and seen it in person? Yeah, yet? I have not seen it yet. Yeah, so um, so basically it's a, it was a big abandoned building, and it was starting to fail into the Kentucky River part of it. So they wanted to renovate it, turn it into a wedding space. And the first part they had to do was repoint all that mortar that was falling, right? So when they dug up this concrete floor in this nondescript room, they started running into these old foundations. And they were like, that guy that's around here that does whiskey... Um, distillery archaeology let's call him and see what he thinks and the first time they called i actually ignored the call it was something like hey nick we found something old on our distillery and i get that kind of call often so i ignored it and a week later they called back and uh, they're like no seriously get out here so they gave me a weekend because i I went out there there's big open uh there's like mortared stone walls uh, all kinds of like brick and stuff laying in the floor and there's something but we couldn't really tell what right so they gave me a weekend, figure out what was actually going on. It was the best weekend of my life. I spent like 21 hours there digging around, drawing maps of walls and stuff. And um, I was telling them about it the next day, and I was talking about the dirt, right? Um, I was like, n- nerding out about all these layers of soil and stuff, and I just happened to mention the fermenting vat walls right there. And they're like, wait, what are you talking about? And I was like, the fermenting vat wall. This here on these Sanborn maps. It shows up in the 1891 and the 1910, and it says copper line fermenting vats. But up until then, there was no reason to think that these things were underground. They thought they were on the surface of the floor. They were taken away at some point, right? And that's what changed that whole project from a weekend to over a year that I spent going to Buffalo Trace. It was like the best year of my life. But um, so when we started digging that out, we realized that all those fermenting vats were there, and we were able to start piecing together the artifacts, um, the actual history itself through those foundations that were remaining. And then we actually found Taylor's book that he wrote advertising the distillery basically and he was explaining his thought processes like why he lined the vats in copper and stuff like that and there's enough information there that um buffalo trace is actually starting to recreate that whiskey that bourbon right now right so if you look at uh, pictures on um like my instagram account you can actually see that copper lined vat and it'll be about eight years before we get to taste what they're making but right. it's incredible incredible but yeah, there's so much more to the story as well. But you know, but why were they buried? Because they were of no more use. Um, so they were buried. Were they originally in, sunken into the ground, though? That's what they I'm were. curious. Oh, okay. okay. So that it might have been just a innovation that Taylor was trying. I'm not entirely sure because I mean, 14,000 gallons. It takes like a little bit of. Uh, a pressure to maintain that right and he did eight of them right in a row and it might have had something to do with that or it could have been a little bit of um showmanship because if you look at the um lithographs of that place it's beautiful yeah and he spends a lot of time talking about the sanitation issues of those distilleries could it have also been temperature control yes because yes. if you bury them it keeps it at a more consistent temperature and mm-hmm. as we know above ground it would have been subject to the climate of kentucky with cold winters hot summers Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you bury those fermentation tanks so that only the tops are exposed you can keep the temperature more consistent right exactly year round and then i've also heard uh, superstitions from the 1800s of people worried about vibrations of floors interrupting the fermenting process i mean i don't think there's anything to it but that would have also been prevented by burying these things right of course today we play music to vats and stuff barrels and stuff sonically age them and all that right so what did they fill these things in with um the vat itself yeah the vats when they when the the in the back in the 30s 40s or whenever when they finally shut that still house down. Yeah, well, like literally the vat itself. So they knocked the um, 
top uh, three feet off the top of these things, filled it with most of that brick. They took all the copper out, of course, and we found a few scraps here and there. But other than that, it was the dirt laying around the distillery. So we found a lot of brick, a lot of random soil, and a lot of coal cinder coming out of the boilers that were right next door. And they just put concrete over the top of it. Yeah, and it sunk down, actually, because whenever we started cutting away that floor with the concrete saw, the little blocks, they like, fell into a void because everything settled. It was a little bit wet when they filled it, you know? And um, it was filled in about the 1950s by Shinley Distillers when they owned that property, and they kind of um, decided to cut that part of their market away, salvaged everything, covered it in concrete, and left. And everybody forgot it was there. So we literally, we could find one picture of that room after the whole project was done because it was so unremarkable and people just forgot anything was there at all. You know, I'll bet you Elmer would have known about it. I think so. There was a few people that said they'd heard rumor and whatnot, but they hadn't really, there was no reason to look, you know? And um, I'm just fortunate that Buffalo Trace took the time to stop and call me back after I ignored that call, you know? Yeah. And then, actually, uh, whenever we figured out what it was, they completely changed their entire process. The renovation project got turned on its head, and instead of wedding space, there's now, like, an open hole in the ground with catwalks over it and, like, bubbling, fermenting vats and stuff. It's, it's incredible. And, of course, the budget went up exponentially. Probably. <laughs> I wasn't involved with that part of the project, though. <laughs> what else have you been working on lately as the bourbon archaeologist? <laughs> It's kind of hard to follow uh, Bourbon Pompeii, but I've been um, going to a lot of things like these and talking. But I'm also starting to pick up the work that I dropped when Buffalo Trace called. So I'm looking at old farm distilleries. We were looking at one that um, a Revolutionary War hero, he was distilling in 1796 with a slave in Woodford County, Kentucky. We don't have a name for the slave at all, and the only reason we know the person existed is um, there's an ad selling him as one of the finest distillers in Kentucky. We don't even know if he was actually sold and continued to distill or whatever, but there's a, a story there that I'm interested in unpacking, but also these other farm distilleries, like there's another one run by a small family, the Eppler family, that um, they worked through the Civil War, known locally for their fine whiskey, but um, not really picked up. It's not in any of the histories anymore. So those are the ones that I'm interested in looking at. And then I'm kind of toying with the project of comparing a whole lot of moonshine sites in Daniel Boone National Forest. So they have something like 287 moonshine sites that have been documented, but nobody's looked at them systematically, compared them with each other. And I think there's something there that could provide some information, some innovations maybe for, that would be useful in the industry. You mentioned the uh, issue of slavery. Uh-huh. At what point, well, maybe it's not fair to ask at what point, it's some, we are sooner or later going to have to reconcile some of Bourbon's history with the slave trade. Right. Because even George Washington's distillery in Virginia used slave labor. And we know a lot of the early ones did, but realistically, it's kind of hard to trace any of the current bourbon companies back to that because most of them went out of business during Prohibition. Right, right. Brown Foreman is about the only one that stayed in operation that can actually we can actually trace back, but even it started after the Civil War ended. Right, exactly. Same thing with Jack Daniels. How... How can we unpack that? Well, we can start unpacking it by supporting people like uh, Fawn Weaver and Uncle Nearest brand, right? Because, I mean, she's got an amazing story. Right. There. And you have a slave who became emancipated, taught Jack Daniels how to distill. And the thing that's incredible about that brand is they've got just plethora of historic documents, pictures of the family, all of that stuff. That does not exist in most of the other examples, right? So you can take that known and start comparing it with all the unknown examples that we have. The the one that I mentioned a second ago where we have no idea what the fellow's name is, but we can start talking about what those people's lives were like. And so that's what I plan on doing. Every chance I get, I'm going to support Uncle Nearest and some others that are um, starting to look at these things as they come up over time. Are there undiscovered distillery sites out there? Or do we pretty much know where everything is now? Oh, no. (laughs) I think that if if you spend time almost anywhere uh, from Kentucky to the coast, Atlantic coast, I think you could probably find distilleries pretty easily. 
Um, I find of new ones every single time I, I pick up a map or start um, digging around. And most of the time, it's not me that finds them. It's people that are in that area. They're like, oh, you're working on this distillery? How about you go and look at these others that have been known by our family forever and ever? And then you start finding, oh, well, there is a dot on a map that says Epler Distillery here. Or there's these documents where they're paying taxes. And um, so I took... Uh, when I first started doing this, uh, Chet Zolder's book, Bourbon in Kentucky, right? right? And I mean, there's, what, a few hundred uh, distilleries that he's got listed in there. I think you're easily looking at probably three or four times that because those are mostly the industrial distilleries, the farm distilleries, the moonshiners. There's lots of texture to the, the bourbon history that's still to be found. And that's exciting to me. <laughs> Nicholas Laraquente is known as the bourbon archaeologist and works with the Kentucky State Historic Preservation Office and the Kentucky Heritage Council. The tour of Bourbon Pompeii is available as part of the Old Taylor Tour at Buffalo Trace. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few, discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The one I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the Old Forester 150th Anniversary Batch Proof Bourbon. While I have samples of all three batches and will be posting my tasting notes for all of them at the WhiskeyCast website, let's focus this time around on batch number three. It's bottled at 63.4% ABV. The nose has notes of candied orange slices, brown sugar, herbal hints of dill and rosemary, honey, and a touch of cherries that develops slowly with time in the glass. The taste is dry and astringent with a good pepperiness, balanced by touches of honeydew melons, spearmint, and honey. The finish is long and dry with subtle hints of spice and citrus. I'm scoring batch number three of the Old Forester 150th Anniversary Batch Proof Bourbon, a 92. Now let's look at Glenmorangie's new A Tale of Cake Single Malt. As I mentioned during the news, this one is finished in Tokai wine casks and bottled at 46% ABV. The nose reminds me of pineapple upside down cake, and there are hints of orange peel, ginger, butterscotch, and demerara sugar for a nice, complex aroma. The taste is sweet and candied with a subtle hint of spices, along with ginger, licorice, and shortbread cookies. The finish is short and sweet with a hint of dry spice. I'm scoring Glenmorangie's A Tale of Cake a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey, which will be releasing the next batch of Penny's Proof later this year. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey distilled on-site in Baltimore. Last year's first release of samples sold out in hours. The only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. You can sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. I mentioned the Octomore 11 range from Brook Laddie during the news and received samples of three of the four whiskeys ahead of this week's launch. The only one I have not tasted was 11.2, and the .2 releases of Octomore usually appear only in travel retail. Octomore 11.3 is made from Isla-grown barley and peated at 194 parts per million of phenols. It's bottled at 61.7% ABV. The nose has notes of dried leaves, heather, and peat smoke with a good maltiness and hints of grilled citrus fruits. The taste is malty, smoky, and peppery with ground peppercorns complementing a good peaty character and a hint of toasted bread with orange marmalade in the background. The finish is long and smoky with that same hint of orange marmalade on toast and lingering spices. 
I'm scoring the Octomore 11.3 release a 93. But the Octomore 10-year-old may just be one of the best Octomore releases yet. As I mentioned during the news, it uses first and second fill X bourbon barrels along with some virgin oak. It's peated at 208 parts per million and bottled at 54.3% ABV. That extra time in the cask does wonders. The nose is gentle and refined with a nice but not overwhelming peatiness and hints of manuka honey, tropical fruits, and just a whiff of brine. The brininess does come out on the palate, though, which is thick and nectar-like with a good smokiness, as well as touches of grilled pineapple, oak tannins, mango, and papaya. The finish is long, smoky, and gentle with subtle hints of citrusy tartness. I'm scoring the Octomore 10-year-old a 94. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,900 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Now, before we get to your voice, just a reminder, next time around we'll announce our latest Whiskey Club of the Month winner. If you are a member of a whiskey club and want to nominate your group, it's easy. Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com and tell us a bit about your club, how many members you have, your tastings, and stuff like that. If your club has a website or a social media presence, we'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at whiskeycast.com, too. You might just win two dozen Whiskey Cast Glen Cairn glasses to use at your club tastings. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. And as you might expect, most of the comments this week focused on the Jim Murray controversy and my commentary about it in the last episode. Fortunately, almost all of the comments were positive, and the handful of critical ones on Twitter were deleted before I could screenshot them. I received this note via email from a longtime listener who did not want his name used. I commend you on your commentary this week, Mark. The old Burke quote, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, becomes more critical in these increasingly uncivil days. Now it is spilling into whiskey. Our goal should be to raise standards and those who do not be held to account. Keep up the good work. Stuart Staples sent in these comments via email. And I'm quoting now, Great to hear your piece on sexist and misogynistic terms to describe whiskeys and to call out Jim Murray. It is unbelievable to think that people who hold positions of influence in any industry think they can still write and communicate in the way you detailed. It is incredible his editor and publisher didn't pick it up either. If I used these terms in written or verbal communication in my day-to-day work, I'd be reprimanded, and if I persisted, let go. These attitudes are disrespectful and outdated. Society has become a little too woke and sensitive for my tastes at times, but in this instance, you are absolutely right. We are living in the 21st century now, and sexist dinosaurs should not be tolerated. It needs to be pointed out, though, that Jim has self-published the Whiskey Bible for the last several years, so there is no one in his organization to hold him accountable. From Twitter, at Yersot had this comment, Are the whiskeys in the examples of the main thread available for review on your website? I mean, I buy tasting guides to know how they taste, not to read quite sad, I had sex once stories. We canceled the Whiskey Wednesday webcast this week because it would have taken place just as protests were beginning in many U.S. cities after a Kentucky grand jury declined to indict any of the Louisville police officers on criminal charges directly connected to the Breonna Taylor shooting and only indicted one officer on a lesser charge for firing into adjacent apartments. After that, Irish Whiskey Barry at Irish Whiskey BC 
tweeted this note from San Diego, California. I have a lot of respect for the decisions made and positions taken by WhiskeyCast over the last few months in relation to justice, equality, and just doing what's right. Kudos. Thank you, Barry. I did mention some of the critical comments that were taken down. One came from Wales and specifically criticized us for reporting this weekend on Twitter that Pandaren's chief executive had declined to comment on the Murray controversy. Before the tweeter took his comment down, though, he did comment that he had enjoyed a 2011 interview that I did here on WhiskeyCast with, quote, the one and only Jim Murray and accused us, and me specifically, of overlooking Murray's sexism in the past. Well, I kind of wish he had not deleted his tweet, because he has a valid point. I have interviewed Jim on WhiskeyCast a number of times in the past, as I pointed out last time around, and not once did I ever call him out on this. For that, I am sorry. It was a disservice not to just women in whiskey, but the entire whiskey community. I can't go back and change that, and we're not going to pull down those episodes, but I promise to do better in the future. If you have a comment, a suggestion, or a question, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, Our look at the history, science, and other things that all make the world of whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. During the news, I mentioned that Brown Foreman's Old Forester bourbon is celebrating its 150th anniversary. Most bourbon aficionados know that George Garvin Brown was the first bourbon maker to sell his whiskey in sealed glass bottles. Up until that time, whiskey had always been sold by the barrel to taverns and stores, and there was nothing to stop the owner from adding stuff into the barrel to stretch the supply and make more money. But, and this is going to come as a shock to those who criticize today's so-called sourced whiskeys, bought in bulk by entrepreneurs, and bottled under their own labels. That's exactly what George Garvin Brown did back in 1870. When he started Old Forester, he bought whiskey from three distilleries in Kentucky, Atherton, Melwood, and Mattingly, and blended their whiskeys together before bottling it to ensure consistency. In fact, he did that for more than 30 years, until he bought the Mattingly Distillery in St. Mary's, Kentucky in 1902, and went into the distilling business for himself. One other bit of history here. Who is the foreman in Brown Foreman? Well, George Garvin Brown started the company in 1870 with his half-brother under the name J.T.S. Brown and Company. That partnership later dissolved, and in 1890, Brown joined forces with another George, George Foreman, who was his accountant and a trusted friend, They named the company Brown Foreman. George Foreman died in 1901, and Brown purchased his stake in the company from Foreman's family, which is why the company remains in the control of George Garvin Brown's descendants to this day. If there's something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you, 
You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.